Let's begin to find our seats this morning. Let's sing that song, Glory, Glory in the Highest. And glory, glory in the highest, glory to the Almighty. for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on uprooting rejection. There's Sunday School for all ages, also Spanish-speaking Sunday School as well. And we're open in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. Help us, God, open our hearts that we would apply it to us. And we thank you for all that you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 27, which is our launching scripture. We are looking, our series is Uprooting Rejection, and we're looking at the principle of rejection in people's lives, uh, however it comes. Of course, we've only talked about the family so far as the root of that, but uh, in any way from any person that you received a message of disapproval, lack of value, lack of worth or love is uh, rejection. The reason why we're looking at it is, in my experience, rejection is the root of so many unhealthy, destructive emotions, reactions, and choices uh, in life. So what we're doing is we're looking at the roots of rejection and then what it produces in order to uh, bring freedom. And I say every week, what we're looking at is not psychology, but supernatural deliverance and the power of truth. That is what our series is about. So we're gonna look today at uh, some rejection reactions and how people react against the, uh, the feeling of rejection. Psalm 2710, of course, is our launching scripture for today's lesson even if my mother or even if my father and mother abandon me the lord will hold me close okay and we've said each week this is the possibility of rejection and the answer is god ultimately and what he wants okay let's talk about reacting against rejection we're talking about the principle of rejection because one of the most basic and fundamental needs that you have in life is love. God actually created us for love. You cannot live without it. And when you get love from, of course, other people, and we've only talked about the home so far, but this is in every area of life, receiving love, it produces emotional health, mental health, spiritual, and relational health. When you receive love, then you, through the rest of your life, are also able to receive love when you move in new relationships. You're able to give love. And so, of course, if we're starting with the home, uh, most people in life at some point will get married. And so you want to be able to receive love in a healthy way. You want to be able to give love in a healthy way. And then the other thing that's very important, and uh, these are only just foundational statements at the moment. When you have experienced or received love, it's not just a past event. It's not like... Back when I was born in 1964, I felt love. It's an event. It's not that. Love in life goes with you. And what happens is that it enables you to process life. Every event, every new relationship, every problem, I don't know if you understand this, you look at life the way that you feel. So when you feel loved, you are able to 
process and make correct decisions. We see this in the life of Jesus Christ, John 13, 2, and, 2 through 4. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Okay, this is very interesting. Jesus made a decision. He was able to serve. But what is the starting point of service? This was something that only slaves did. Menial. In other words, that's low. I don't, you know, there'll be, I don't do windows, right? There are things, I don't do things. But the Bible says, because he knew that the Father had put all things under his power. In other words, I know who I am. This is very profound in life. You are able to process correctly. And, and so that is the ideal. Okay, having said that, that is what love does for you. If that's true, that means then a classic strategy of hell is to make sure that you are not loved, but rejected. Now, we've only talked, the only thing we've really talked about so far is your home, how you grew up. If you read rejection books, and I got tons of them, you'll find that many of them start with the 900 different ways you could be rejected in life. And I just don't feel that that's helpful for me to just go through a checklist of, did this ever happen to you? Were you ever embarrassed when you were in school? And you get that anything in life, any relationship, any event that caused you to not feel loved or not feel valued or to be embarrassed or in any way, those form rejection um, uh, messages in, in our lives. So, for most people, rejection comes through somebody else. So, we've talked about your family, your parents, your siblings. We could move on. Some of you here, your rejection came through marriage. Others, it came through people at school. Some of you are still traumatized over uh, bullies in school or things that they used to say to you, school and that. Normally, rejection is through people. Events, that gets in, maybe we'll look at that in another lesson, but it's, it's through somebody. So you get from somebody the message that you are not loved or that you are not valued. That, I don't care who it came through or why, that message is a lie. Remember, we've been looking at other lessons. The, the, the message that you are not loved is a lie from hell because God loves us. And this is one of the things when we get to the point of full healing, you come to the point where you understand people do not determine my worth. Because rejected people, one of the things is often they then are looking for someone to give them value, and that's a, that's a mistake because you already are loved. Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, this is... Paul is explaining his approach to life. Right? This is not just a theological fact. How many of you believe that God loves you? Check. Amen. No, no, no. He's saying, this is how I live my life. My life starts here. I am loved. Because that then will determine my decisions, my reactions, my emotions, and everything else. So, rejection is a lie that comes from outside. Someone says you don't have value, I don't love you, I didn't want you, whatever it might be. When that lie is given from outside, it produces lies inside. 
And the reason why we're doing this, uh, this lesson is you cannot receive messages of rejection and stay the same. Rejection always has an effect until you overcome that. Then you can uh, have preventative healing. So my, my point is, you cannot get someone who gives you the message is like, oh, I'm stupid and worthless and you wish I was never born? Okay, what's for dinner? That's not how it works. Rejection marks us, which is why the devil wants you to be rejected, and now it produces lies. So, what happens in the human heart? Human nature reacts against rejection because it is such a violation of our being. You were made for love. So when you are rejected and get a, the, the lie message that you are not loved, people react against it. And that, of course, will be in, in personality. So some people accept rejection. They take that on board. You're right. And the rest of their life, that's it. I am stupid. Yes, I am worthless. I, they, they repeat that. Because that's their, their nature is accepting. Others, they fight against it. But either way, it's a reaction. Most people's lives are filled, if you look at how they feel and their emotions, how they react to situations, the decisions they make, if you peel back the layers of the onion, you will discover why are they doing that? This is actually why I, even in the first place as a pastor, became interested in the principle of rejection because it would puzzle me. I'm dealing with people, it's like, but that's, but the way you're thinking, that's not, that's not good, that's not healthy. You, you act, you're actually hurting yourself. And I began to ask, why would you do that? And so this is, I believe God led me. So most people's lives are filled with reactions to rejection and that works out in their relationship with God. It works out in human relationships, right? This either accepting or fighting rejection, or it just is internalized in their inner and emotional world. Okay, all of that is now the foundational statements to what we're going to talk about. Let's talk about some re common reactions to rejection how do how do rejected people react against that lie message that they have no value so number one common reaction is some people become driven to perform right someone gives us the message you have no value you'll never succeed you're worthless okay so some people is I will show you. In life, I will win. I will succeed. What is it? I will make money. Look at what I'm worth because of what I drive, how much money I make. Sports. There are, there are sportsmen that are driven. You, you know some of LeBron James, phenomenal sportsman. He's a driven man. You read about him is rejected by his father. He's going to show his father what he is worth, achievements, career, and all these kinds of things. So it is a healthy thing in people to want to succeed. That's good. If you have no ambition in life at all, that's not healthy. Most people want to succeed in some way. That's a good thing. To achieve, the danger is when your desire to achieve or succeed is a desire to prove your worth or to prove somebody wrong. Years ago, I was uh, reading uh, a book on mountain climbing. This man was telling the story. He became, became very successful at mountain climbing. He climbed El Capitan. This is a, a, a mountain in, uh, what, Yosemite National Park, if I remember right. Very difficult. He did this and scaled it 
solo, which is quite an achievement. But what fascinated me is that this man, I can't remember how old he was when he finally did this. He was like 28 years old. And he described, so that's a pretty good feeling. I climbed El Capitan by myself, but he said he started shouting, are you proud of me now, dad? Dad wasn't even there. Right? So there's a drive in him. I'm going to show you. you. You gave me the message I wasn't worth something or you're never happy with me. I will, I will prove that I am worth something. So that, but that's unhealthy. Right? How many of you know if you're having arguments with people who aren't there? You ever do that? That's, uh, that's, that's not a good thing. If achievement is a, is a means of proving or gaining worth, you have a big problem because no success will ever satisfy. There will never be enough. Does anybody, do you have an app that says, if I make this amount of dollars, my absent father will finally approve me? Approve of me? No. That's internal. That's all within you. What's the dollar amount that finally shows you're worth something? What's the success measurement? Would Olympic silver be good enough? Or it has to be gold? Right? This is, this is all within us. The problem with people who are using success in any level, even the things of God, if you're using that as a way to fix what's broken inside, or if you're using it as a means to prove, I want you to understand you will never be satisfied. There will always be this haunting little voice saying, you could have done better. And you will be a successful, miserable person. Because the success is not the issue, it's not the problem. And then, of course, this is even true, this is why in discipleship, I challenge disciples, you must deal with your rejection issues. Because if you have rejection issues, you'll bring that into the house of God. You'll use the things of God, you'll use helping people, you'll use evangelism you use pastoring as a means of proving worth and and it is not if you're not doing it for god that's why jesus said peter do you love me uh, i failed do you love me yes then then love people care for people so this, is not, this isn't about your worth he didn't say peter you are somebody look at how good you did all right so being driven to perform is a reaction that is somebody who is fighting against the lie that I have no value. Look at a second common reaction is that is people seek counterfeit acceptance. The opposite of rejection is acceptance. Right? Acceptance has love, value, worth, identity. So when people get a message that you are not accepted, you're not loved, they are driven to find acceptance, but it's a counterfeit, it's fake, it's not healthy. The need for acceptance is so strong People will search for it even in destructive ways, right? Young people who join gangs, and of course our gangs are very limited here, but I've lived in big cities. People are driven. You go into a gang, you kind of understand there's, you're not finding Nobel Prize winners in the gangs, right? These are not quality people. People are driven for unhealthy friendships, right? Your friends are dirtbags. 
Yeah, but they're my dirt bags. <laughs> right? They accept me. This is, this is the whole, this is actually why people would join a criminal gang. Because it, it's more than the money. It's acceptance. It's, it's love. Think about this. Judges 11, verse 3. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. Okay, so this is interesting. <clears throat> Jephthah was a man. He was utterly rejected. He didn't, you know, no one here can choose to be born, right? Dad had a concubine. He had a woman on the side that he was not married to. He has an illegitimate son. And uh, later on, dad dies. And all of his brothers who are legitimate, they say, get out of here. We don't want you. So this is his react reaction. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. Who does he go? Does he say, I feel rejected. I am going to go find some scientists to hang out with. No. Worthless rebels. Because rejected people, they often don't reach up, they reach down. So gangs, that, that is a reaction, that is a counterfeit acceptance. Think about sexual attention. There are people, and, and of course this uh, often uh, applies to ladies, they have been given the message that they are not worth anything, they were ignored, not spoken to, not valued in some way. So they are now driven. I want people to see me. So through some ladies, this is through sexual attention, how they dress. My wife and I marvel when we fly. It's like, did you just come off your night job? Like, why would you dress like that in public? Because there is a drive, they're looking at me. I have the eye of every man. <laughs> that's, that's a poor substitute. Sexuality is like this. For some people, sex itself, that is God created, I, I'm very pro-sex, by the way. I'm, I'm for it. But if you have been rejected, sexuality for people becomes a substitute, a, a means. I was reading in a, in a book, there's a testimony from a lady. She's talking about how she was very promiscuous. She said, I hated how I felt after sleeping with a man I didn't, even enjoy it. I didn't even enjoy the sex, but for a few minutes, I felt loved. You know, if you know human nature, that wasn't love at all. That was a lie. But there's a drive. For some people, this is men. Men who are rejected, they view sex in unhealthy ways. Sex is not about love. It's about proving manhood. This is often a difference between men and women. This is why young ladies, let me tell you, if you sleep with a man, he's going to brag. You know this? They'll put your phone number on a toilet wall. Because this isn't about love. This is about, I got her. I have value. That's why some of you ladies here, you have been married to serial adulterers. Why would you do that? Why would a man be driven to go from woman to woman to woman he's not married to? It isn't about the sex. It's I am showing. I have value because she wants to sleep with me. People are serial fornicators. They just move from, like... Every time you do this, it wrecks something, causes, why would you do that again? Because there's a drive to connect. Talk about two more issues here, and we'll get into some deep waters. One of those is pornography. If you 
think that pornography is only about nudity or sex. Why are you looking at that stuff? He likes boobs and bums. You're actually very much missing the point, especially when there is a drive or uh, some compulsion in this. Pornography is either a craving for intimacy. When you did not get love for some people, in a, this doesn't make sense. It's crazy, but they are searching for a connection with someone. So, of course, that's an absolute lie that I can view something on a screen, look at a, a photo, and make a connection. That's, that's, for some people, that is the allure. For other people, pornography is avoiding intimacy. Right? Intimacy is messy. It, when you love someone, there will be days when the birds will sing, right? The carpenters will be singing in the background, why do birds? There'll be other days that you want to poke each other's eyes out. That's, that's because intimacy is messy. There are people that they do not want the mess of intimacy. They, they avoid it. This is what, what, if, what if they reject me? What if, I don't, I gotta. So pornography is a way I can avoid the mess of intimacy, I click, she wants me. Okay, and I, I understand these are deep waters we're, we're getting into. One final reaction, let's talk about homosexuality. We don't often talk about this in, in the church, but homosexuality is a twisting of identity. It's a twisting of where you gain Value. Why is it some people are drawn? It's a lie that you're born that way. Is often there are roots, sexual violations. I read a book one time from a counselor. He said, In 35 years of counseling, if I speak to homosexuals, I've never met one. If they'll be honest with me, I've never met one that their formative sexual experiences were normal. And he's not even talking about marriage, even just between a boy and a girl. He said it was always something twisted. There was force, rape, abuse, pornography, something else. So these violations, when something is twisted, if I come out and I see a tree that should be growing like this and it's going like that, I don't assume it was born that way. Right? There's something making it that way. You have people that they have hard to please, fill in the blank. Father, hard to please. Mother, nothing was good enough. And so their reaction is, some people then, I do not want to be what I am. I don't want to be what you want me to be. And, uh, and so you, uh, sexual abuse, of course, People repel against that or rebel against that in unhealthy ways. You have people that their gender was rejected. Dad really, really wanted a boy to complete the baseball team, and he got you. You were a girl or vice versa. So there are people that get this message. So now what happens is they search for acceptance. They find someone who will accept them. But, but it's actually a reaction. They're reacting against being rejected. Or then you can have, have this, people who never got the love of a man, but that, now that's what they're looking for in a perverse way, but that's what they're searching for, the love of a woman. So I, I appreciate these are deep waters. You're talking about deep roots, but... My point is, for some people, these are reactions. I choose, I look at life, I feel certain ways. Why do I feel like that? Why do I do that? It's the roots. Okay, we're going to talk about one thing, and then we're going to open for questions, and that is being dominated by rejection. This is... 
overall, this can take many forms, but overall this is many people, their whole life is a reaction against rejection. Okay, rejection is an assault on your value. Someone gave you the message, you are not loved. That is absolutely wrong. So, in some ways, it is an assault on your pride, right? So, the reaction of many people to rejection when their pride, their worth is assaulted is they enthrone pride. They make their pride a god. And now their pride or their sense of value, it is the most important factor in all of life. It actually rules every area of life. We looked at this briefly last week and talking only about marriage, but the problem with rejection is it affects your viewpoint. Rejected people do not look at life in healthy ways. They see things that are incorrect. They see things that aren't, aren't there because of what's in them, not, not what is outside of them. Titus 1.15 talks about this. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and consciousness are defiled. Okay, and this, we looked at this verse last week. It says... If your mind and conscience is defiled, there's nothing pure. We, we said that's often we use that in, in sexual ways. But now let's talk about rejection. If your mind has been infiltrated with the lie that you are not loved or you have no value, which is assault on your pride, now you see everything through this lens. It's how you see yourself. It is how you see other people. It's how you see God. If, if I was to put on sunglasses right now, really dark sunglasses, and I would be looking at all of you, I could go, you people are really drab today. Just look at you, you're all kind of gray and colorless, but that would, that would be false. That's what rejection does. There are people, they wear rejection glasses 24-7. And they're looking at people. They're looking at themselves. They're even looking at God. And they're coming to totally wrong conclusions. So, here's the problem. Rejected people view everything, and I mean everything in life, as a vote on their worth. They view everything as a possible assault on their worth. It absolutely dominates their life because they view all of life through rejection glasses. So, the most common reaction to rejection, we applied this last week in marriage, but it's interpretation. To interpret means you assign meaning to words and events. That's what rejection does. Everything is happening. What happens in your day? What happens in traffic? You're assigning meaning to that. Every look. Some of you are tormented in church, aren't you? Because in church you're looking around and you go, they looked at me. They didn't look at me. You're, you're assigning meaning. That's not what, how life is, is supposed to, to work. So, look at some of the lies of interpretation. Number one, rejected people are easily offended. Because they are looking at every word, every action, every look as either approval or an assault on their worth. Everything is a vote. Think about road rage. We live in a weird world, right? You read the paper, somebody? He shot somebody to death. He beat somebody to death. Why? A lane change. They changed lanes right in front of you and didn't even signal. 
<laughs> there are people that, right? I know why they did that. They deli- Do you know that everybody else in traffic does not have a meeting before you get on the road? He's coming. <laughs> they were looking at their phone. They were picking their nose. She was putting on makeup. They were daydreaming. No, no, but, but this is the problem. You get that, this like, whoa, dude, it was a lane change. Because this is not a lane change to him. It's a vote on my worth or an attack on my worth. Angry people. There are people that go through life constant. There's, there's something boiling on the inside. And it doesn't take much for Hulk to erupt, right? Genesis 4, 23 and 24. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Okay, so this is now a man, I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me, and this probably wasn't even physical. This probably was road, early road rage. Your donkey cut off my donkey in traffic. But, but this is over the top. If Cain is avenged seven times, then lay back 77 times. Like, whoa, dude, what is going on inside you that you're reacting like that? Why would you look at life that way? Rejection. Words. I, I think I mentioned this in, in passing. You say, you know, maybe ladies here, you tell your friend, oh, you look nice. What do you mean by that? Are you saying I don't normally look nice? <laughs> looks, as I said, are people, it's, it's looks. They're, you're looking at me, or you're not looking at me. It's a, it's a vote. Actions, or, or lack of actions. I, I pastored in South Africa. South Africa is, is a nation built on rejection. If you think about it, apartheid racism then rejected everybody non-white. Right? So these people live with rejection. So I pastored in a culture of rejection. <clears throat> and it's universal, but, but very amplified there. I had a woman that had come in, got saved. She was a faithful lady. Good lady, attended for quite some time. One day she came up and she was very upset. And she said, of course in South Africa they talk in the third person, why does pastor hate me? Oh, she's talking about me. What? Why do I hate you? Like, I was dumbfounded. I prayed for this lady, helped her, preached to her, talked to her. Was the, what did I do to give you the idea that I would hate you? And she said, because you walked right past me in church one time and you didn't shake my hand. <laughs> You understand, when I come to church, I only have about 9,000 things I have, I have on my mind at any given time. But you see, that was, this wasn't a handshake, a greeting. This was a vote. So because I walked by and didn't shake her hand, aha, that's proof you hate me. She's in terp. That's a miserable way to live. And this is why I'm doing this. Some of you, you are miserable because that's what you do. You interpret Everything and then even events in life. Remember what I said about Jesus? Because he had starting point of love, knowing who he was, events didn't rock his world. Rejected people, they view the events of life as an assault on their word. Listen, life doesn't go well sometimes. Right? You hear me tell good stories of how God helped me, but I can tell you lots of things that didn't go well in life. Stuff happens. I've had outreaches where lightning struck and blew up the projector. I've had services where no one came. Imagine no one coming to hear me. <laughs> the, the problem is there are people, this is why events in life, their business goes under, they flunked a test. This is very common. You've got people, they flunk a test, they commit suicide depending on cultures, very strong. That's a little extreme. Because in their mind, it's a worth issue. 
every event in life. This is why, as I said, I, I really urge disciples to deal with your rejection issues because pastoring, when you're dominated by rejection, is tormenting. Don't ask me how I know this. But because there are pastors, is, is everything is like, they didn't come. They didn't come. Yeah, because grandma's in a coma. No, that's not why. Every service, the attendance was good. The offerings were good. Life is worth living. But then Wednesday, put the gun down. <laughs> because you're, everything is a, is a vote. And that's just a miserable way to live. One final false reaction is that rejected people accept false guilt. Think about this. Rejected people, again, in interpretation, they look at events in life and they interpret it like this. This bad thing happened because it's my fault. I must not measure up because something didn't work out. That's not fair. Some things just don't work because something went wrong. There, there, there are events that are, you understand this, there are, you should do good in life and I, I get cause and effect and sowing and reaping. Yes, that's true. But there are things in life I don't control. Like I said, literally, my first outreach in South Africa, lightning struck and blew up the projector. And then, when we're having a major outreach, I'm going to have a rap concert with Stacy Dillard at Shop, uh, not ShopRite, uh, whatever that, uh, the mall, it's been too many years ago now. It was going to be fantastic. I hand him the mic and the heavens open. Listen, I'm not in charge of lightning. I know you, some of you think I'm powerful. I'm not that powerful. <laughs> I'm not in charge of weather. A complete, I mean, it washed it. So, if I take something that I don't control in the first place, if I was a better Christian, lightning wouldn't blow up my projectors. That's, that's not healthy. But this is what rejection does. The economy goes south, so therefore your business didn't work out. There were people that started a business on 9-11, 2001. Really bad time to start a business. There were people that started businesses, like in February of 2020, just before COVID. So the economy, but they interpret this as it's my fault. And so now we bring this into people. Yeah, I want to be fruitful. I want to, I want to get people saved. I want to work with new converts. But if you're dominated by rejection, the problem is, Listen, read the parable of the soils. Not every person stays saved. Do you know that? If, if you're taking this personal, they backslid. Listen, I grieve for every person that backslides, but I'm going to sleep at night because people do what they're going to do. I, I have that. I care. I'll pray. But, I, but I'm not going to curl into the fetal position because somebody decides to sin. Parents, this is deadly. My wife and I have known people or have had friends that their children don't serve God and they can't function in life. It's like they, they can't even show their faces in public. Listen, foolishness is in the heart of a child, even your children. So do your best, set a good example, correct, love them, do all the things that we talked about. But listen, kids will do what they're going to do. You, how many of you know that you can't make people serve God? You can't make your kids serve God. By all means, I'm, have them come in church, let them be respectful. But if they don't want to serve God, that's not a vote on your worth. I cannot function in life because my child chose to sin. That is rejection talking. And that, that produces very unhealthy. So, 
The problem with lies is that they produce emotion. None of the things I'm talking about are simply information. Hmm, yes, worthlessness, ah, oh, yes. No, 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 it produces things. There are people that, as I said, they live with anger. There are people that live with a constant sense of, sense of hurt. Anxiety. Sadness, depression. And because we feel things, we assume what we feel is true. I feel worthless, so I must be worthless. I feel like it's my fault, so it must be my... No. That, that is why I'm doing this lesson. Rejection starts with a lie. And it puts down roots of lies into your soul. And some people, because they feel there's emotions connected to these lies, then they assume, that's who I am. This is what I am. They all are, they're, they're all out to get me. Why? Because I feel it. And that those are, rejection makes life miserable. You could say amen internally, that'd be fine. <laughs> Okay, let's open for some questions or comments. And I appreciate we just covered some deep, deep waters. Pete, in the back there. First thing, we really always did believe that Pastor Mitchell was in charge of the weather <laughs> during the conference. Uh, years ago, there was a study done. Uh, I can't remember by who, but they took two girls, and one of them was bright, outgoing, fearless. Uh, just confident, and the other wasn't. And they began to put them together in a room, and over a period of time, every time the bright girl did something, she was uh, rebuked for, she was told she was wrong, and the other girl was always the right one. It was a horrible study because it destroyed the right girl. She began to stutter, she began to second guess everything she did, and she was seven years old. Years later, decades, I think she was in her 40s or 50s, she sued. Because she yes. said, I've never been the same. I've never been able to get my life together because of the, the way they pounded her with that. Everything she did, she was rejected. Yeah. And so they literally, it changed her life. Yes. Forever. Yeah. Rejection does that. You get people, they, they still talk about the bully in the third grade. You wrecked my life. Right? It's an ongoing effect. Who's that? John Kern? Back there. It's interesting to, to note that uh, uh, Mao, uh, Hitler, and Stalin were all rejected by their parents, by their father. I, I didn't hear that. Now what? No, no, now. Uh, Mao Zedong. Oh, Mao Zedong, yeah. Hitler and Stalin were all rejected by their father. Yeah, rejected by their father. Very profound thing, yep. We're going to talk about rebellion later on and the connection to... Rejection. Uh, one of the, you know, I guess the way I spent my life basically just in, in general was kind of just doing my own thing. And then I remember my brothers passed away. My other brother was in prison and I just completely disconnected. It was, I could live life completely away from people. Didn't care, family, friends, whatever. And then I got saved and it was like, I came to a crossroads. All right, do I want, I want to be discipled. I can't just run away get married. I can't just run away and disconnect and how salvation forced me to come to these crossroads and, you know, even just being on staff, you know, getting my butt kicked occasionally, I had to force myself. I remember sometimes in breakfast, we're washing dishes and I said, I'm going to go sit down between Pastor Mitchell and Pastor Greg. I'm going to force myself to ask a question <coughs> and how much that helped me is this salvation just always brings you to this place where you you kind of have to deal with things. I can't yeah. just run away every time we fight or when my daughters do something that I don't like. It, it's no, I have to face these yep. things in life and it's just yep. profound. And there are people that do run away and it's not good. Betty? When I began to do nursery many years ago, <clears throat> Sister Mitchell did nursery every Sunday and we had naughty kids because kids are naughty. 
<clears throat> and they do all kinds of things. You know, we call the two and potty train the shark pool because they bit each other. <laughs> but um, she would, I would hear her say over and over to the women, they're like, my little boy is so bad, or my little girl did this or that, and she would say to them, what you say in front of them, they're going to live up to. The words you speak about them, they are going to live up to. Yeah. And I had a friend that would say, oh, he's so bad, he did this here, he did that, and she would kind of laugh about it out of her embarrassment, I guess, but Sister Mitchell would pointedly say to her, he will live up to the words you're speaking yeah. and the way you're reacting to him. It was a tremendous lesson for me. I wish I'd known that much sooner, yeah. but it was a tremendous lesson, even the way I dealt with people in the nursery and the way I dealt with them with their children. Yeah. What we say matters. Very good, excellent comments. Okay, very quickly, healing rejection reactions. I try to give you a little bit of hope at the end. You, we're gonna do whole lessons on getting healed, but. Uh, think about this. If rejection causes you to enthrone pride, you, you will not get rid of the reactions or the feelings of rejection unless you deal with pride. So, James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Okay, so if you're an angry person, if everything in life is a vote on your worth, that's pride. The whole world isn't about you. So that's something we have to repent of. We, we have to recognize that's not right. We have to see. Humility is simply, I see things correctly. Not everything is about my worth. So God, that's wrong for me to act like it is. And then we need healing and deliverance. What I said in all of this, I, I appreciate. I just touched some very deep waters for some of you. You've lived this. What you need is not for me to say, you are somebody. What you need is you need a miracle. Because some of you, these are demon spirits run your life. Tormenting spirit. You sit in church. There are voices in your head and it's not God. It's actually not even just you. You need to ask God, heal me here, and you need to cast out that tormenting spirit in whatever manifestation it comes. And then, of course, if rejection causes you to interpret, it's you see lies, you need God to help you, you need to ask God to help you to see clearly and correctly. Matthew 20, 32 through 34. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion, touched <clears throat> their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Okay, the, the gospels are filled with stories about blind people seeing. I, I, don't, I only know a couple of blind people personally. So but those stories are God heals physical eyes. But isn't this what we need? What do you want from me? Lord, open our eyes. Wouldn't life be completely different if you didn't see everything as a vote on your worth? Right? If you saw that not everybody's out to get you, wouldn't that change your whole life, how you feel? Wouldn't that change your marriage? your relationships, it would change everything. So wouldn't that be a practical prayer? God, heal me. I repent of enthroning pride, but God, open my eyes. Please help me see things clearly. Because if we don't see things clearly, then life is a torment and we'll come to wrong conclusions every time. Let's close with prayer. I'm, I'm deliberately ending all of these lessons asking God to help you. God, right now, you have spoken, you have touched deep issues in the heart. There are people here, God, they are beginning to see lies that have been put down deep roots in their soul. I need you. God, open our eyes. Let us see clearly. Enable people to, to recognize lies Help them to see that they are loved by you. 
and that God bring a deliverance. Please, God, open everyone's eyes that are here or that are watching. I am asking you, there will be a complete deliverance. Rejection will be uprooted in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Service will start about 1030.